continue on page 355 in the Book of Common Prayer. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be you, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen.
I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I have a question. Is anyone familiar with Pope Pius XI or the time when he served as Pope? All right. Well done, good and faithful Protestants. <laughs> Actually, it's always interesting when you celebrate a certain feast day at a certain time, but you start to dig into the history and you reveal something a little richer or fuller in your understanding of why we celebrate certain days like today. It seems reasonable that a feast day named Christ the King Sunday would be celebrated and trace its roots somewhere back to Judaism, say with King David, or the line through the Catholic establishment throughout the centuries or even through the Anglican tradition and the kings of the Church of England. The real key to noting this feast day is to understand a little bit of Catholic history and papal history. So to answer the question about Pope Pius XI and this feast day, <clears throat> it would be really important to understand the beginnings. It seems like it would be one that would be first, second, third century, but it was actually part of Pope Pius XI's first encyclical called Quas Primos, which means in the first. It was written in 1926, less than a century ago. And it was actually written in response to the widespread fascist movement around the world and the secularization of many countries, especially countries that were heavily Catholic in their faith. These Catholics were being oppressed by these government leaderships and Pope Pius XI was seeking to offer some hope and fortune about how Christ as King overall would lead us to right places, even though, you know, there were rulers at all different times on earth at different lengths of times when countries ruled over their people. The biggest challenge in 1926 post-World War I was that they were basically trying to take God out of the equation and eliminate anything beyond complete secularization. Now, in 1928, and in support, many of the Protestant denominations adopted this celebration, or feast day. And interestingly enough, it was until 1969 celebrated on the 31st of October. Now, I'm sure you can imagine once I tell you why that was done and why it was placed there. Simply put, it was to celebrate prior to the keeping of the feast day of All Saints Day, to lift up all those who served in keeping the faith of God in Christ and protecting many who were martyrs. So it was natural that it would come the day before November 1st, All Saints Day. Interestingly enough, in 1970, it was moved to the last Sunday in Pentecost, or the end of the church year. In the same vein, though, to celebrate all those who had gone before us. What's also interesting is not all Episcopal churches necessarily celebrate. It's become more popular in the past decade or two, but it was never listed in the 1979 Book of Common Prayer. It was noted by the liturgist who writes a lot about the Book of Common Prayer, Marian Hatchet. The feast is unofficially celebrated in some Episcopal parishes, but it is not mentioned in the Episcopal calendar of the church year. 
Hatchet notes that the collect for proper 29, the last Sunday of the church year, is a somewhat free translation of the collect of the feast of Christ the King in the Roman Missal. So, before we view it strongly as this medieval or Judean kind of kingly holiday following David and the line of kings, it also helps if we set that thought against what is said in our gospel today. Now, we understand that Pilate has been sent this man who was accused of many things, but we also need to remember that it was Pilate who was very close to Herod the Builder, who was King Herod the Builder, very wealthy, and they were well known to spend a lot of time together in the spaces around the kingdom of Israel, what is now Israel, and while King Herod the Builder was slated to rule Israel in the Roman Empire, he kept the peace on the side of the Jews, and in turn, Pilate would do what would be considered some of the dirty work for the Jewish leadership. Now, as we know, kingship would not be allowed officially under Roman rule, but because of this balance of power and having a king meant that all those people would remain calm and not start riots. They built this relationship for peace. And I think on Pilate's side, it was just simply so that they didn't have to move troops around to quell riots or quash rebellions, fighting over who's in charge. And it ended up being effective for both sides, in a sense. Interesting part of this very short passage of the gospel is that Pilate identifies him as being accused to be the king, and understanding the politics of such a role begins to speak to him kind of in that manner. Interestingly enough, when asked if he was king or not, Jesus, like always, or like often at least, he doesn't really directly answer the question that's being asked. Instead, Jesus had a more broadly adapted and complete answer to that question. And I think, for me, when I think about Christ the King, and I think about the question being asked, as I was reviewing these readings and thinking about it, praying about it, it was captured by two words. For this. Jesus answered, for this I was born, and for this I came into the world. In a sense, this is why I'm here. Call me what you will. Now, Jesus understood as the Son of God, he would have the power over not just anyone he chose on earth, but also all those in heaven. But he never acted on it. Consider Pilate's perspective. <laughs> He's understanding as a, Roman, as a Roman military leader and also governor, and then also think about what could be going through the mind of Jesus as he stood there. He says, in short, if my kingdom was here on earth, my people would be seeking to defend me. My kingship comes not from this world. And just for a second, I want you to think about all those times when God sends messengers to earth. They always come in the form of an angel, and there are always two other words that we usually see before an angel speaks to anyone on earth. Simply put, and we'll get to it in Advent, fear not. Now imagine for a moment those angels, and the reason they say fear not. Usually they have multiple faces, multiple wings, Multiple appendages, appendages stand 15 or 20 feet tall and are fiery, bright, and terrifying. So just for a second, think about that conversation 
and what Jesus could have said or done. And imagine if, as Pilate asks the question and he answers that his kingdom is not of this world, that 15 or 20 of these angels just show up. Except this time, they don't say, fear not. They just stared out Pilate. Imagine the reaction. Now, I think that that reaction would probably be the same as it mentions, and I believe it was Luke, when the soldiers report that angels came to roll away the stone at the tomb. The translation is basically, in short, those tough Roman soldiers, some of the toughest of the tough, passed out in fear. So you can just imagine how Pilate and all those soldiers around the palace may have acted. I think they would have passed out. I don't think there'd be any different reaction than those at the tomb. But we know for a fact Jesus didn't come to be a king. He didn't come to be like David, although he was from that line. He came to lead in fairness and in truth. He was drawing on something, again, as God had and continues to try to get across throughout all the centuries, before, during, and after. He was trying to connect to those whom he created, to those who he loved deeply. And continues to love each and every single day. Whether it was God's chosen people or those who had not yet heard the good news. Or those who chose at that point not to believe. Or those that had believed and died for their faith. God was simply seeking to reinstate the same thing he always had. Which is the truth in love. The truth that began, as John so beautifully points out, in the beginning was the Word. And from that day forward, it continues to today. So now today, this last Sunday, before we enter into Advent, this is a time to consider, before we get into the first and second coming, coming of God in Christ, and as we sit ourselves in the in-between space between his first and second comings, and as we consider all that we've talked about in these past weeks after Pentecost, where we are to be forming ourselves both individually and collectively to understand just the thing that Pilate and Jesus talked about. Why Jesus came in the first place. He stated it to Pilate. Jesus came for the truth in love. The truth of God's love. And the truth of God's desire to love each and every one of us. But also that we as individuals and collectively should love one another as much as Christ loves us. And we're to take that love out into the world and love our neighbors. Now, if kingship reminds you too much of human rule, instead of thinking king, think of Jesus as the bearer of truth. Because, in a sense, he wasn't a people leader. He was a concept bearer of that truth in love. Now, we will start again to recount all that is to come with Jesus' birth. In fact, it makes it very easy because Advent is translated to come. What's to come in the form of this tiny baby? The truth that God, out of his deep love, would send his son for each and every one of us, past, present, and future. That is a truth in all seasons that we should share. We should not only hold it in our hearts, but we should seek to, to share it in truth and in love. 
not only for those of us that are here this morning, or those that are closest to us at our Thanksgiving tables to come, but for those that we have not yet met, or for those we just met. Jesus never claims to be king, but what he does say and what he does claim is to be the way and the truth and the life. Seek the truth and remember that we have a job to do, to love one another just as Christ loves us. Amen. Continuing at the top of page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. Say together, we believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all this seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified and promised Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and as his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, of the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Javon, Bishop Haynes, Bishop Curry, Mary, Carol, and any others you may name aloud or silently in your hearts. We pray for all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray the Anglican Church of South America. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for Allison Johnson, ordination process, and the Reverend C. Berkeley Ford and Marion. We pray for Christian unity for Francis, the Holy Father and Bishop of Rome, for Bartholomew, Ecumenical Patriarch of Constantinople, for Barry, Bishop of the Catholic Diocese of Richmond, for Sharma, Bishop of the United Methodist Conference of Virginia, and for Phyllis, Bishop of the Lutheran Synod of Virginia. We pray for the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who are in our and all who see the truth. We pray for Justin, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Sean, our presiding bishop, Susan, our bishop, Mark, our priest in charge, and for all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God in the church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Lord, we pray for all the countries that are going through conflict and political instability. We ask for peace to be restored. We pray that you would grant wisdom and integrity to world leaders so that they would work for the good of the people they govern and serve. We pray that citizens everywhere would have their rights preserved, would be free from fear, and would know stability once more. Amen. Amen. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Nancy and Noah Dula, Selena Dutch, Heather and Michael Evans, Robbie Field, Jim Flippin and Terry Basil Flippin, Maureen Fuster and family, and for all who are part of this Christian community of St. Francis Parish. We will exalt you, O God, our King. And praise your name forever and ever. We pray for all who have died, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We will their thoughts to you. We remember before God this day all members of the armed forces and their families especially for members of this parish deployed in harm's way. We pray God's blessing upon them, wherever they may be. In closing, let us join together in the prayer attributed to St. Francis, which can be found on page 833 of the book. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is danger, let us so love. Where there is injury, we pardon. Where there is discord, union. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. Grant that we may not so much seek to be in soul as as is in soul, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in harmony that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Continuing, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Saying together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done. And by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty.
God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Will you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. interested in making an Advent wreath today, we'll, we'll, we will be doing that after the service. I also want to make you aware that on December 14th, which is a Saturday, guys and gals will be getting together. Uh, we start about 9.30 in the morning. You can dribble it at 10 if you want. Uh, we're going to do a cookie swap and we're going to decorate the commons. Um, so that's Saturday the 14th. And, oh, you might have noticed a sign out on the lawn. Uh, there will be pet photos with Santa here for the next four Saturdays. And this is put on by the Pug Rescue um, people, of which uh, Sarah Cowell's daughter and husband are uh, founders, I guess. And the, uh, the fee for that will be $10 plus a non-perishable item so that will be on the next Saturday, four Saturdays from 11 to 3. Thank you. In the prayers of the people, uh, we ask your prayers for Don and Lee Rick, and I just wanted to share, uh, Lee called me this past week, uh, and she says that Don has entered hospice care. Uh, we were sad to hear. Uh, because of his condition, and you may recall that, uh, that she was injured falling onto a trailer. Uh, they have moved in with their son up in Newport News. She asked specifically, uh, or she mentioned specifically, that while that provides for them in terms of their medical needs and so forth, uh, that she misses this parish very, very much. She asked to be remembered, so I'm sharing that with you. Thank you. This is also a 
time where we celebrate anniversaries and birthdays for the month. So are there birthdays or anniversaries to celebrate and pray for? <coughs>
Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <clears throat> Our closing hymn is 544. Hallelujah.